Good afternoon. The first item of business is consideration of a business motion 5255 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for today and tomorrow. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 5255. Minister. And I'm moving just to confirm that this uh, revision allows for a ministerial statement on the audit autumn budget statement today and uh, one on waiting times audit report tomorrow. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 5255 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to portfolio questions. Uh, the first one is on health and well-being. Question number one, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what the reduction has been in the number of hospital-acquired infections in the NHS Ayrshire Man area since May 2007. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, NHS Ayrshire Man has achieved significant reductions in the two key healthcare-associated infections for which routine surveillance is undertaken. The latest statistics for NHS Ayrshire and Arm, published by Health Protection Scotland covering the period April, April to June 2012, showed that compared to January to March 2007, the number of C. difficile cases among the over 65s fell by 71%, and the cases of MRSA and MSSA fell by 69%. Kenneth Gibson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Can you advise the Chamber what impact this has had on hospital mortality in Ayrshire and Arne, and how many lives have potentially been saved over the last five years as a result? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, since October to December 2007, the hospital's standardised mortality ratio has fallen by 12.9% for Air Hospital and by 30.7% for Cross House Hospital. This compares to a national fall of 11.4% demonstrating that Ayrshire and Arne has made significant progress in reducing hospital mortality, improving patient care and clinical outcomes. Across Scotland, their efforts will continue to reduce hospital mortality, and I expect every hospital and every NHS board to drive improvement, drawing in all the support and expertise available from the Scottish Patient Safety Programme and Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what funding is available for research to help protect against hospital-acquired infections and which will hopefully offer benefits to patients in the longer term? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I had the pleasure of announcing some additional funding last week of £1.8 million to help tackle this problem and to undertake necessary research so that we get absolutely on top of it and build on the substantial progress made in recent times. Question number two, Tavis Scott. Uh, Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government when, uh, what its reasons are for not changing the regulations governing new pharmacy applications to allow an NHS board to consider any applications submitted rather than applications in sequence. Cabinet Secretary, Alex Neil. Uh, Presiding officer, the NHS Pharmaceutical Services Scotland Regulations 2009, as amended, set out the provisions and arrangements by which applications to open a pharmacy are made. These rightly leave decisions and applications in the hands of individual NHS boards. As my colleague Shona Robson, then Minister for Public Health and Sport, said in her letter to Tavish Scott of 26 September 2010, in relation to these regulations, quote, while there is no requirement within the regulations for NHS boards to consider applications sequentially, I understand it is established practice for them to do so, end quote. I can confirm to Tavish Scott that that position has not changed. We have therefore no plans at present to amend the regulations in this regard. Tavish Scott. Uh, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his reply, but will he consider changing those regulations? Because I'm sure he's got other uh, uh, constituency examples around Scotland of these regulations not allowing a health board to consider a range of applications at the same time so as to come to the best decision for taxpayers' money and also the best clinical decision for, uh, for people in a particular uh, area. He'll know from that case that it uh, involves the pharmacy in Scalloway in my constituency. Uh, it needs to be seen to be fair. The process currently is not seen to be fair. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, my mind is never closed to change, and uh, if Tavi Scott would like to arrange to, a meeting with me to discuss these issues, I'd be happy to discuss them. But I would need to be persuaded, obviously, of the case, and the evidence needs to be there 
to justify any amendment. Question three, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of NHS Lancashire and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, Presiding officer, Scottish ministers and officials meet regularly with representatives of all NHS boards, including NHS Lancashire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Siobhan McMahon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, can he tell me on what date he or indeed his officials, acting at his di direction, last contacted NHS Lanarkshire regarding the modernisation of mental health services in Lanarkshire? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, in my previous answer to Siobhan McMahon on this issue, I made it clear that I decided early on in my tenure to give responsibility for this matter to my deputy, Michael Matheson, as I did not want any perception of any potential conflict of interest between my role as the MSP for Airdrie and Shots, where Monkland's Hospital resides, and uh, my role as Cabinet Secretary. I'm therefore happy to ask Mr Matheson to write to Ms McMahon again with the detail uh, that she's seeking. Clear Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government if they are providing any extra support for NHS Lanarkshire to cope during the winter months, given that we know this brings additional pressures to the NHS? The uh, presiding officer, uh, we have made available £3 million for all the health boards in Scotland to deal with the additional pressures of winter, and that includes NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, I am happy to write to uh, Claire Adamson with additional detail if she requires it. Richard Simpson. Uh, presiding officer, is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the concerns I have been raising on junior and middle grade doctor staffing over the past few years, which were dismissed by his predecessor, as always, as scaremongering? Uh, uh, today, Lanarkshire Health Board are reported as being concerned about their junior doctor recruitment. The Glasgow Health Board has reported significant problems in relation to middle grade recruitment, and this is on top of the South East Paediatric Service problems of which he is fully aware because he's had provided additional finance. Can he say, therefore, whether he has abandoned the ill-thought-out plans to cut senior training grades for doctors by 40% by 2015, and FY01 and 2 by 20 per cent. Captain Sexton. Presenting officer, uh, there is quite a lot of uh, detailed in, uh, requests for information in that question, but generally speaking, uh, can I say I don't think it's any secret that the National Health Service in Scotland, like the National Health Service south of the border, faces some shortages in the availability of very specialist services, some of which were mentioned by Richard Simpson. Uh, I've spoken recently to Sir David Carter, for example, who is chair of the academic board in relation to these matters, and we are reviewing all of these aspects. I mean, it's not just in relation to particular specialities. There's a particular problem, for example, in rural areas as well. Uh, so it is a matter that I am looking at very seriously and looking at whether any additional measures are required to deal with any of the specialist shortages, because clearly if there is a specialist shortage, then uh, uh, that means that uh, there is uh, the potential for a gap in service provision, which is not what we desire to see happen. Question four, Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what key issues were raised by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing at NHS Ayrshire Arran's annual board review meeting on the 17th of December. Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, I thought the board's annual review was a challenging but largely positive meeting. As the member knows, I wanted to hear from the board in the areas that have been unsatisfactory in the last year, such as the local adverse events process, the management of information, including FOI compliance, and the systems in place for outpatient appointments. The board has made some progress in these areas, but the government will keep this under close review. I would also want to recognise there is a lot of positive work going on in NHS Ayrshire and Arm for the benefit of local people. This is a testament to the dedication and professionalism of all local NHS staff, and I once again thank them for it. Change for the better will not be delivered overnight, but following Monday's review, I believe we can look forward with some optimism under the new leadership in NHS Ayrshire and Arm, and as, as I have said, to the mem as I've said, the member can be assured we will keep this under close review. Adam Ingram. I thank uh, the Minister for his answer. On the question of board governance and management accountability, how does the Cabinet Secretary propose to deal with the clearly evident deficiencies and gaps from recent experience in Ayrshire and Arden? 
Lack of accountability to the local public ha has long been evident. Witness board attempts to close Air Hospitals A and E at Labour's behest. But more recent failures to implement learning from significant adverse events reveals an absence of effective scrutiny of senior management by the board and a reluctance to hold those personally responsible for those policy areas to account. Sir Adam Ingram raises a number of very pertinent and fair points. Uh, let me give a specific answer in terms of Ayrshire and Arne and generalise that in terms of the general issue of accountability. First of all, in terms of Ayrshire and Arne, I made it absolutely clear publicly on Monday as the chair of the annual review that I expect the highest standards of accountability and transparency, not just from Ayrshire and Arne, but indeed from every health board in Scotland. I also, after the annual review, had a special meeting with the non-executive directors of the Ayrshire and Arne Health Board, a practice I intend to repeat every time I do an annual review or Mr Matheson does an annual review of any health board. And I've made it clear to those non-executive directors and I'm making it clear to every non-executive director throughout the NHS in Scotland that part of their job is to hold the executive to account to question, to probe, and indeed to visit the front line on a regular basis so that they can see that, uh, what is actually happening on the front line, which should then help them inform them about what decisions they should be making about the future of the health service in their area. John Scott. Presiding officer. As the Cabinet Secretary will know, at the board meeting on 5th December, NHS Ayrshire and agreed the submission of an outline business case to the Scottish Government's Health Directorate Capital Investment Group for a £22 million upgrade to A&E services mentioned by Adam Ingram at Air and Cross House Hospitals. Will the Cabinet Secretary give favourable consideration to these proposals, which represent a substantial and welcome proposed investment in emergency and unscheduled care services in Ayrshire, and which will underpin seven-day-per-week consultant-delivered E&E services at both Air and Cross House Hospitals? Please. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, maybe I should declare by interest as a resident of Air, uh, but uh, obviously when these proposals come to me, for consideration, we'll give them due consideration, as we would do with any such proposals from any health board in Scotland. I cannot help but comment, even in this festive period to John Scott, that had his government not had a 26% real-time cut in our capital budget, I would be able to approve many more of these projects than I can do because of his cut. Question 5, Nanette Mill. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government which NHS infrastructure projects in Grampian will proceed following the extra capital funding announced in the autumn statement. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, there will be an announcement following portfolio questions today by Mr Swinney. Our priority for additional investment is to address backlog maintenance and NHS Grampian will share in any additional capital resources made available to NHS Scotland. Whilst welcome, the budget consequentials are significantly less than the total value of the shovel-ready projects published by the Scottish Government on the 2nd of December 2012. The Scottish Government's capital budget has still been reduced by 26% in real terms in 2014-15 compared to 2010-11. Then it will. The Secretary for his answer, I'm not sure I, I will be welcoming it. Um, with the significant growth in the population in Inverurie and following the decision not to proceed with the planned Giri Life Centre development, there is a real need for the Inverurie Health Centre and Community Maternity Unit to proceed. The First Minister has stated prior to the autumn statement that these significant projects, including the Inverurie Health Centre and Community Maternity Units, could get underway now rather than being delayed. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament when announcement will be made to give the green light to these NHS Grampian projects? Cabinet Secretary. The presenting officer under the normal due processes, I will make any announcement on that subject at the appropriate time. Question number six, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether its policies and priorities for the health service are being undermined by UK Government uh, policies. Cabinet Secretary. The Presiding Officer, a health care provision is a devolved responsibility. I must reiterate our continued commitment to a publicly funded and publicly delivered national health service in Scotland. 
we have categorically ruled out the reforms underway in England uh, and have reaffirmed the commitment to continuing to provide world-leading, high-quality and sustainable health care for the people of Scotland that reflects the values of the National Health Service. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, this Parliament recently passed the Social Care Self-Directed Support Bill, which will ensure more disabled uh, people live with dignity and independence. Does the Minister therefore agree that the UK's gov Government's wrong-headed assault on disability benefits will undermine the Scottish Government's commitment to independent living? I, I, presiding officer, it will be no surprise to the Chamber that I absolutely agree with that point of view. I am extremely concerned, and like, like many other members, I can tell from my constituency surgery caseload that the impact of many of these reforms, particularly on the disabled community, is extremely serious and extremely worrying. And I am genuinely concerned about the impact on the standard and quality of living of disabled people uh, in future as a result of these benefit reforms. Question 7, Jamidi. Scottish Government, what recent discussions it has had with community pharmacy representatives on the future of pharmaceutical care? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, Scottish Government officials meet regularly throughout the year with community pharmacy representatives regarding current and future funding of NHS pharmaceutical care and services. In October 2011, my colleague Nicola Sturgeon, the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, announced a review of NHS pharmaceutical care of patients in the community to be led by Dr Hamish Wilson and supported by Professor Nick Barber of the Health Foundation and University College London. As part of the review process, Dr Wilson and Professor Barber took oral and written evidence from a wide range of stakeholders including patients, the NHS and pharmacy representative bodies, including the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, the Professional Body for Pharmacists in Scotland, and Community Pharmacy Scotland, representing pharmacy owners. We are currently considering Dr Wilson's report, alongside other national policy initiatives and reports, to help inform the Scottish Government's vision for NHS pharmaceutical care in Scotland. Committee. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that it is over 10 years since the publication of The Right Medicine, a strategy for pharmaceutical care, as we eagerly await and anticipate the outcome of the Wilson Review into the positive role which pharmacists can play in enhancing the health care of patients in the community, particularly in relation to the self-management of their own care. Will he agree to meet with me and representatives of the profession in advance of the publication of the Wilson Review, such as Community Pharmacy Scotland, the Company Chemist Association and the National Pharmacists Association, so that the voice of community pharmacy will not only be heard, but listened to and acted upon? Presiding officer, in due course, the Scottish Government will engage with all relevant stakeholders in taking forward the outputs from the Wilson Report and other key national policy initiatives. A large number of stakeholders were consulted during the review process, and the review leads considered uh, all oral and written evidence submitted to them. This included, as I said, the bodies that I already outlined. Uh, so I hope that uh, gives a satisfactory response to, to Mr. Reedy. Question 8, Hans Alan Malik. Good afternoon, and to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the National Health Greater Glasgow and Clyde regarding the waiting times. Data. Cabinet the presiding officer of the Health Directorate meets with all boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, on a regular basis to discuss all aspects of waiting times, including data. Malik. Uh, thank you uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for the his reply. He will be aware of a report that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde audit of waiting times data found that Failures in quality of data made it difficult to verify the validity of patients being classified as unavailable for treatment. Can he give me a clear guarantee today that the NHS Glasgow and Clyde are not involved in this waiting time scandal? And also, would he be too kind as to publish the audit today before tomorrow's announcement so we have an opportunity to see sight of it? Presiding officer, I have given it two commitments uh, at the request specifically of Ms Jackie Bailey and the Labour Party. One is that I would publish these reports, all 15 of them, prior to the recess, 
And secondly, I have responded positively to the request for a ministerial statement, which will be made tomorrow. I give an undertaking that I will publish these reports and place them in spice in plenty of time for members to have a chance to read them prior to my making my statement. Jackie Beale. And I very much welcome the action by the Cabinet Secretary in that regard. But as well as there being problems with retrieving data from Glasgow, which does make you wonder how figures are supplied to the Scottish Government, the sampling undertaken by PwC in South Glasgow suggested that in 100 patients, 56% of them had periods of social unavailability applied. In North Glasgow, that rose to a staggering figure of 62 patients, one indeed waiting as long as 168 days. Does the Cabinet Secretary consider that these periods of unavailab unavailability in Greater Glasgow and Clyde are in any way acceptable? Cabinet Secretary. It would be wrong of me to comment on bits of a report uh, without giving members the opportunity to read the whole report and then they will see the report in total context. As I said, I will publish the whole report. I do not intend to get into the habit of commenting on leaked reports or parts of leaked reports until the full reports are published and people will see that the conclusion reached in respect of Greater Glasgow and Clyde is a very positive conclusion indeed. Question 9, Stuart McMillan. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to assist people with visual impairments. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, the gov Government is currently working with statutory and third sector partners to develop a Scottish sensory impairment strategy. I expect that this will be issued for consultation early in 2013. This builds on the success of the sens sensory impairment one-stop shops. As a member will know, Scotland has an eye care system that is world-renowned. Uh, the Government has introduced free eye examinations for everyone in Scotland. The Eye Care Integration Project provides an innovative link uh, between optometrists and the local ophthalmology department within hospital to allow fast and efficient patient referrals. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, recently, I have been representing a constituent who suffers from dry macular degeneration. And they raised the issue of their benefit entitlement. They have been through the ATOS process and as a result they have had their benefit entitlement removed. Uh, therefore, I would like to actually ask the Scottish Government what action it can, it can take to assist people with dry macular degeneration uh, as they are suffering at the hands of the UK Government's austerity measures. Minister. Well, I am sure that there are no members in this chamber that are not aware of the concerns and difficulties which are arising from the work capability assessments and the impact that is having on uh, disabled people such as Stuart McMillan's uh, own constituent. Uh, the important thing is that individuals who find themselves in this situation are provided with the best possible advice and support in pursuing their individual claim. And uh, action I often take with my own constituents is to provide them with advice through a welfare benefits advisor or through a specialist service. One of the things that we have rolled out over a number of years now is the one-stop shop uh, we now have 11 of them uh, across the country which are there to provide support and assistance to those with a uh, sensory impairment and they can also provide them with advice around uh, welfare benefits. But I fully recognise the concerns and difficulties that uh, Mr McMillan's uh, constituent experience is experiencing and I would uh, much prefer to be in a position where we could take action directly as a government on this type of issue to make sure that it is more aligned with the views and values of the people of Scotland. Question 10, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thank you, President Officer. As, um, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in rolling out the Child Smile Service to schools and nurseries in the NHS Forth Valley area. Minister. Since uh, rolling out Child Smile Services to schools and nurseries, NHS Forth Valley have recruited all nurseries in their area to participate in the toothbrushing programme. This includes private, council and partnership establishments. We, they have also received 100 per cent engagement from all independent dental practitioners into child smell practice. Within the last three months, NHS Four Valley have achieved a full complement of child smell staff. This will increase the amount of preschool and primary school children able to access the fluid varnish programme subject to parental consent and child participation. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his reply. Um, he will be aware that members recently received the National Dental Inspection Programme report, which highlighted there is a continuing trend of improvement in the oral health of primary one children in Scotland, with 67 per cent having no obvious decay experience in 2011 12. 
What can the Minister do to ensure primary schools in areas of socio-economic deprivation do not have the opportunity to opt out of this worthwhile uh, child smile programme? Minister. Uh, the member um, makes a very good point because I think since the Dental Action Plan was published in 2005, real progress has been made in improving oral health care in Scotland overall and it's drawing a considerable level of international interest now um, as a result of the success which the member referred to, the 67% with no obvious decay uh, in primary uh, ones. We need to make sure that we continue to build upon that success and I am determined to make sure that we do so. I understand that NHS 4 Valley uh, do not offer targeted primary schools the option of non-participation in Child Smile. Uh, 19 primary schools within the 4 Valley area were targeted as being in the cohort in the most deprived uh, areas. The board have exceeded the target and have now, record, have now recruited some 29 primary schools within the NHS 4 Valley area to participate within it. I understand that there continues to be one primary school within NHS 4 Valley area that has not participated in the scheme to date and the NHS Board Child Smell team are in dialogue with them to encourage the school to participate in the programme. And given the benefits that have been gained by the other schools who are participating in it, I would encourage the school to take up the opportunity to participate in Child Smell. Question number 11, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to tackle smoking. Minister. We are committed to maintaining Scotland's position as a world leader on tobacco control. That is why we are developing a new tobacco control strategy for publication early next year. This will set out ambitious targets for moving towards a smoke-free Scotland, underpinned by a range of actions focused on prevention, cessation and reducing health inequalities. If we are to make smoking a thing of the past, it is essential that we reduce the number of young people who take up smoking. Our ban on the display of tobacco in shops has a key role to play in this area, and I welcome the Supreme Court's rejection of Imperial Tobacco's legal challenge against this legislation. The ban will come into force in April next year for large shops. George Adam. I thank the Minister for his answer. I am extremely pleased to hear about the plans to make Scotland smoke-free. Can the Minister estimate how much money the NHS could save if Scotland becomes smoke-free? Minister. Um, I think it is important that when we uh, discuss smoke-free, it is uh, about tobacco-free, uh, without putting fear into those who may have a coal fire. But uh, can I say that it is an important step, I think, in recognising there is a country we intend to be progressive in continuing to reduce smoking in Scotland. It is estimated that the cost to the NHS on an annual basis uh, from, uh, the, from conditions associated with smoking is between £320 million to £510 million each year. When we also consider the other aspects relating to uh, smoking, such as the cost through loss of pro productivity, uh, clearing up uh, the litter associated with smoking, the damage caused uh, to, uh, by smoking due to fires, uh, the total cost to the Scottish society is estimated to be something in the region of £1.1 billion on an annual basis. That is just the financial costs, uh, President Officer. There is also the human cost of tobacco and the damage that it causes to families and communities across the country, with one quarter of all deaths in Scotland being attributable to smoking. I am sure the Chamber would agree that this is a cost which is simply too high and why we need to continue to move towards Scotland being tobacco free. Stuart Maxwell. Sorry, uh, question number 12, Gordon MacDonald. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government what actions are required to reduce health inequalities. Minister. Addressing determinants of health and health inequalities requires concerted, along with targeted and tailored action in true partnership with the communities affected. It also requires a preventative agenda to break the cycle of inequalities we see repeated in a number of our communities. As a government, we are taking action across three key social policy areas, the early years framework, achieving our potential and equally well. I have also reconvened the Ministerial Task Force on Health Inequalities so that we can review progress to date and to consider what further action is required in the years ahead. God, MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, NHS Health Scotland recently produced a paper for the Task Force 
Task Force on Health Inequalities, and it stated, without action to reduce the income, wealth and power inequalities which currently plague Scotland, it is very unlikely that we will reduce the human tragedy which is represented in the health inequality statistics. Does the Minister agree that a yes vote in the referendum on Scottish independence will provide an opportunity for a much more radical change in political direction from the rest of the UK in order to tackle these issues? Minister. I'm sure uh, all members in this chamber will recognise that tackling Scotland's health inequalities requires a multiple agency approach to dealing with these issues effectively and that a short term approach will never be effective in dealing with inequalities which have developed over generations uh, within our country. It is important that we take all the necessary action uh, that is required in order to close down these health inequalities. But the reality is that a health response to tackling health inequalities in itself will not deal with the issue. We have to deal with the range of determinants that impact on health inequalities, and finance and poverty are key factors around tackling health inequalities. And the reality is that, as it stands at the present moment, this Parliament and this Government does not have control over the key areas around welfare reform and dealing with the issue of child poverty that is necessary to address these types of health inequalities. That is not to say that we can't make progress in tackling these health inequalities, but equally we could make greater progress if we had greater control over all of Scotland's resources. Jackie Bailey. I know it may be Christmas, but frankly, Minister, I found that response astonishing because health inequality is not affected by borders. Let me offer him a practical suggestion. Let me suggest to him something he can actually do as an early Christmas present to those people living in disadvantaged areas. We have the deep end group of GPs serving our most disadvantaged communities asking for more time with their patients to address their complex and underlying problems. Why doesn't he do something about that? Minister. Sadly, Jackie Bailey has just demonstrated a real lack of understanding about the complex nature of health inequalities. There is not a simple health solution to health inequalities. All of the evidence demonstrates that very clearly. And we have Order. all the evidence demonstrates that very clearly. And what we do know is that we need to have a range of policies, social policies, to tackle the whole issue of health inequalities. And I've outlined to the member the actions that we as a government are taking to tackle these types of issues. But can I say to the member that one of the things that can contribute towards tackling health inequalities is the universal provision of some of our health care service benefits, which she now, as the spokesperson for health, has now given up on as a result of her cuts commission. The Louisa government will take all the necessary action, Order. but those members and those benches may choose to stick their head in the sand when it comes to tackling health inequalities, along with their colleagues on the Tory benches, but the reality is that tackling issues such as welfare and finance are key to tackling health inequalities in Scotland. Jim Hume. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with the Chief Medical Officer that health inequalities requires all areas of government policy to be in sync? And if he does, can he explain how often he has met with his colleagues responsible for housing, local government, sport and education to specifically discuss coordinated approaches to addressing health inequalities in Scotland? Minister. Well, I fully agree with the Chief Medical Officer, and I think he's made my point very clearly, and that is that we have to make sure that all of these policies are actually working in an integrated way. And one of the difficulties we have in dealing with some of these issues is that we don't have control over such issues as welfare benefits. Exactly. And no one, no one should be in any doubt about the potential negative impact that the Conservative and Liberal Democrats' welfare reform agenda will have on tackling health inequalities in Scotland. And can I say to the member, in terms of when did I meet with my colleagues to discuss this very issue? I met with them a fortnight ago at the Ministerial Task Force on tackling health inequalities to discuss this very issue, and we will meet again in the new year to continue making progress in this area. Yes. Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Audit Scotland report on health inequalities highlighted one potential impact of the smoking ban, decreased rates of premature and low birth weight babies. Does the Minister believe that minimum pricing for alcohol can also have a similar positive impact on health inequalities? Minister. I think uh, there are a whole range of factors that contribute towards health inequalities, and no doubt alcohol and Scotland's relationship with alcohol contributes to 
that whole issue. I believe that minimum pricing is one of the measures that can help to contribute towards dealing with some of the health inequalities which we have in our society. And I hope that once minimum pricing is introduced, that we will be in a position where we can start to see the benefits that can be gained from that. And I'm delighted to see that uh, uh, the Westminster Government have now recognised the benefits of minimum pricing and intend to bring forward their own arrangements to introduce minimum pricing in England and Wales. Question 13, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration has been given to the availability of drugs to treat cystic fibrosis. Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, the Scottish Government is committed to patients in Scotland receiving medicines of established cost effectiveness and therapeutic value. All newly licensed medicines are appraised for clinical and cost effectiveness by the Scottish Medicines Consortium, who publish advice for NHS boards. NHS boards and clinicians are expected to take full account of SMC advice in the planning and provision of NHS services. The NHS provides dedicated services to patients with cystic fibrosis and the medicines used are a matter of professional judgment by the patient's clinician. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, one of my constituents, seven-year-old Maisie Black, who suffers from cystic fibrosis, is in urgent need of the drug Calideco. The provision of Calideco in Scotland lags behind that in the rest of the UK. I am led to believe that the SMC met on the 4th of December to discuss the provision of Calideco being made available in Scotland. However, this decision will not be known until the 14th of January. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise why there is such a delay between a private decision and a public announcement? Uh, does he agree with me that such a delay is unacceptable? And will he press for an early announcement in this case? Minister. Officer, the, the member will know that uh, I've set up a, a review of the whole, whole issue of the introduction and the access to new medicines being undertaken by Professor Philip Routledge from the University of Cardiff. And I expect him to report uh, early in the new year. And this is exactly the kind of issue that he will be addressing. Uh, and once we get his report, we will look at it and see how we can take matters forward. I obviously fully empathise with anyone uh, in the position that Mr Kelly's constituent is in, uh, and obviously what I want to do as the Health Secretary is to make sure that the entire process for the approval and introduction of access to new medicines is as robust as possible. Question 14, Willie Coffey. To ask the Scottish Government how it monitors and reviews the cost to the NHS of prescriptions issued by GP surgeries. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the majority of monitoring and reviewing of the cost to the NHS of prescriptions issued by GP surgeries occurs at NHS board level by specialist teams of pharmacists, accountants and GPs. The Prescribing Information System for Scotland, commonly referred to as PRISMS, is available to those in the NHS with appropriate confidentiality clearance and provides detailed data on all medicines that have been dispensed in Scotland. Data is available from Scotland wide and down to individual prescriber level. There are many variables that can be monitored, and each board will have a system based on the local need of the patient population. In addition, Information Services Division maintains a detailed database of information on NHS prescriptions dispensed in the community in NHS Scotland and provide regular annually with monthly update reports monitoring the overall spend in Scotland to NHS boards and the Scottish Government. Uh, Willie Crawford. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? According to ISD Scotland, generic prescribing accounts for 83% of drugs prescribed, which is a welcome 6% improvement over the past 10 years. Can you give me any assurance that the costs of branded drugs, which tend to be much more expensive, will be kept under close scrutiny to ensure value for money is taken into account? Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, uh, Mr Coffey raises a very valid and fair point, and I can say that along with the uh, head of the pharmaceuticals uh, section of the Scottish Government, Professor Bill Scott, we are looking very much at improving the way in which the, we ensure that the cost effectiveness as well as the therapeutic value of medicines being dispensed are maximising value for money for the patient as well as obviously maximising uh, the level uh, of patient care. 
Um, we have made substantial progress in a number of areas and substantial monies have already been saved by measures taken in recent uh, months in terms of drugs policy and prescribing policy, but it's an area where we will continue to take appropriate measures to ensure that we get the maximum value for the money that is spent by the NHS on prescription drugs. That ends the portfolio questions. We now move on to a statement by John